Well, dreams are wish fulfillment, and, and the nature of all dreams is that they are the past, without exception. So, when we talk about, you know, our future dreams, we're dreaming of the past. When we talk about the past dreams, we're dreaming of the past. When we talk about our nighttime dreams, uh, it's the past. The content of dreams is the past. The, the, the content of consciousness is the past. I know people have a lot, that's what consciousness is a word that has a lot of different definitions, but I'm talking about how Jesus uses consciousness in the Course in Miracles. Jesus says, consciousness is the domain of the ego. Isn't that interesting? Consciousness is the domain of the ego. There was no sense of a split in, in consciousness or awareness until, consciousness did not arise until the, the belief in separation. So strictly speaking, if you follow Jesus' words when you talk about God consciousness, what that could be interpreted to mean would be forgiveness, because that would be unified consciousness. But consciousness has levels and it can be trained. You know, even when we think back to the 60s and, and free love and, and everyone was going for what? Higher consciousness. What does it imply if you're going for higher consciousness? That there's lower consciousness, that consciousness has levels, and Jesus agrees. Consciousness has levels, it's the domain of the ego. So dreams are the domain of the ego as well, and consciousness is the domain of the ego. Now we're getting somewhere. So, I, I can start to see that that's where, I, that's my classroom, that consciousness. It's the domain of the ego, but I want to unify consciousness. I want to release the judgment that, that breaks it into levels and breaks it into segments, and a higher and a lower, or a subconscious and a, and a conscious. You might say the way to wake up from this world is first to be fully conscious, instead of have a subconscious that's kind of pushed out of awareness. To become, to bring the darkness to the light is to become fully conscious or forgive. And when I think of improvisational, um, it's like improvisational theater, uh, it's, there's a spontaneity aspect. It's, it's not rehearsed and like an actor rehearsing lines and just and just spewing out those lines. It's kind of like there's a spontaneous element to it. In it's in the moment. In fact, Thomas is here and Thomas actually uses uh, improv from the spirit where he will just say, okay, you're this character, you're this character, here's the setting, go. And amazing healings occur uh, through the spirit's use of improvisational theater because it's just a tool that the Spirit's using to bring up the things that need healing. I Actually, Thomas was with me in Mallorca, an island off the coast of Spain, and there was one woman there who had sat there, she'd watched the movie, she'd gone through the discussions and everything, and she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not doing it, it's not doing it, and I'm not having any breakthroughs. And then she went out and she did Thomas's improvisational work where he looked at her out of the whole group and said, you, you're this, you, you're that. And all of her stuff came up in the improv. And when it was over, she told me, I said, what did you do? She said, I just, I made it in the kitchen. My knees were shaking. I could hardly stand, <laughs> stand up. <laughs> through Thomas, through the improv, got in there where whatever else wasn't working. So it's like, oh, yeah, we can get there. We'll get that stuff flushed up and out of there. So I would say it's mostly uh, everything, it's not so much rehearsed, but it's, it all sprang from the unholy instant, this ancient moment of imaginary time in which all illusions seem to spring forth from. All the scripts of the world came out of one instant. And the beautiful thing is they haven't, they haven't gone anywhere. They really haven't been projected out into myri myriad of forms and over many millions of years. They're all still in that same instant. And it's all still simultaneous, and the Holy Spirit has already healed all of it, and that's why, in the end, it's much ado about nothing, because 
because it, it wasn't really spewed out. The ego made it look like a big trick, like it was spewed out over millions of years and time and space, but it's really not that at all. It's healed. Okay, we're back to the atonement. Total escape from the past and total lack of interest in the future. The atonement, it's, it's a word in the Course that means correction. You know, the correction for everything. A correction, if the ego is a problem, then the atonement is the correction. It's like the antidote. <laughs> it's, <laughs> if you've taken the poison, the most thing, you've got to get the remedy. That's what she's asking about. She wants to know about the remedy. Uh, you could say that, uh, I've described it as like, you know, the old analogy of the, of the needle in the haystack. There's a golden needle that's in a stack of hay. And it's in there. And it's covered, <laughs> seemingly, in awareness. It's buried. And there are a lot of lessons. I remember one lesson in the workbook that says, Salvation is in your mind, among all your thoughts. Find it. <laughs> you know, you're reading this book and you're like, okay, <laughs> that's my job today. <laughs> Salvation is the thought in my mind. Find it. Do you know how many tho other thoughts are, <laughs> are in there too? <laughs> yes, find it. <laughs> you know, you're on a find mission today. And sure enough, that's why... We talk about the spiritual journey as kind of negation. You know, we were talking about that this morning, eliminating, you know, 2000. Yeah. That was That's Thomas right. Edison. She was telling the story of, of all the times he tried to find a filament. You know, what would work as a filament. And he went through how many? 10,000? 10,000 10, things to try to find the filament. Well, it's the same when you go through your mind. It can sound really good, like salvation, atonement. It sounds good, but, but you have to you might say, empty your mind, like the Buddha said in Jesus' teaching, of, of desires, of thoughts, of pursuits, of beliefs, of thoughts, of images that you were going after. And, and it's more like, what's, what remains after the process of elimination is, is atonement. Now sometimes people will pronounce the word at one -ment, but actually at one -ment is really f referring to the oneness that's beyond time and space, and Jesus is using the word atonement specifically in the Course, not as at one moment, but he's saying, no, this is the correction that comes right before at one moment, before the oneness experience. So it's an illusion too, because in heaven there's nothing to forgive, and there's nothing to correct, there's no error to correct, but it's the one, it's the absolute one and only illusion that leads out of all the rest. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool to think about going in your mind and searching for the illusion that ends all illusions. And that's really what atonement is, or forgiveness. It is a decision. And if you think about decisions in this world, like decision to come to Hawaii, or take the retreat, or a decision to buy a car, or have a partner, or so on and so forth, all of those decisions are decisions that are made from unconscious beliefs. And once you raise all the unconscious beliefs to the surface, then you're ready for another kind of decision. Not a decision that's, that just keeps you in illusions, but a decision that actually releases you from illusions. And that's why it's so important, we cannot emphasize enough this exposure of, you know, not trying to keep secrets, hold things in, hold things away from everything else, because that's so important to reach that point so that you can accept the atonement. It's the only way you can accept that decision is kind of to eliminate all the other distractive decisions that aren't really decisions at all, except to stay in, in, in separation, which is not really an option in the ultimate sense. So atonement is the decision that ends decision-making. In heaven there's no decisions, in heaven it's pure oneness. You have to have at least two to make a decision, because you have nothing to decide between in heaven. But, atonement is a decision of purpose in mind. Like, last night we were talking with our friend, and I was saying, you remember all the, the things that you've gone through, all the intensities and so on and so forth, and all the distractions, you need to come to that purpose. I was talking about like a rattle for a baby, when you rattle, have a rattle and the baby comes to attention and moves their eyes over to the rattle. 
when you come to discover your purpose, when you come to, to a, attend to, to align with that purpose, then that's a higher order of decision because you're making a decision of what is the purpose of my life, what is the purpose of the world, not what is the purpose of, of a tarpaulin or a, sh a shoe, or what is the purpose of a watch. You see, the ego made up all the images and it made up separate little purposes for every image. If we went around the room and I said, okay, everybody give your vocation, and it would be like the ego's separate little purposes for these little bodies. Oh, I'm a, I'm a writer, or I'm a construction worker, I'm a retreat manager, I'm this, this, I'm retired. I'm, you know, it would, these would be all little purposes, just like the ego gave meanings to tarpaulin and shoe. It gives meanings, actual meanings to identities. So that's why when people say, you know, I am a, a construction worker, I am retired, whatever, they're, they're really saying I am this vocation, and that's really not the truth of it. That's just, again, all the meanings that were assigned by the ego. But those don't have anything to do with spirit or Christ. So it's you empty out all the concepts, and what you're left with is the state of unified awareness, or the quantum field, or the forgiven world, and that's, that's what the atonement is. And if we look at the, the needle in the haystack again, too, the, the needle is representative of only mind is causative. And all of the strands of hay, each one of them, have in common that there's something of the world that's causative. So people have asked me, what's the master switch? Is there, do I actually have to do this through years and years and years and years and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes? Or can there be more of a direct approach? I said, yeah, if you, if you can understand true cause and effect, and the impossibility of causation in form, then you, you go through that haystack in a hurry. Because all of the hay is the same, and the needle is different. The needle is, is the empowerment of your mind. It's a choice for peace of mind that's always been there, but it's been covered over all this false causation, the belief that there's causes outside the mind. So, um, somebody, your, I talked about that this morning. Uh, your aunt weighs, two, your aunt Edna, whatever, weighs 220 pounds. She steps on your dog's tail. Your dog yelps, po, <coughs> yelps, and then you say, "Come on, that's the her foot stepping on that tail is what caused the pain for the dog." Spurious cause and effect relationship. All of Newtonian physics is spurious cause and effect relationship. When I've lived with people over the years and I hear about food allergies and food poisoning and sour milk and all these kind of things that I don't experience and really have never experienced because they aren't real, but I've had to go in my mind and start to see that there's no cause outside of mind. When we say the words, all healings at the level of the mind, is to say that is one thing, but to practice that with everything with all considerations, you know, as the little pine cones are falling, even as I'm talking, <laughs> you know, the little, they can't even, they have no causation. They're not hanging on there for some reason. They're just kind of floating down, going, we were free, we're free of all spurious cause-effect beliefs. We're free, we're free. That, that's where the rubber meets the road, you know. And it takes a lot of practice because everything in the world was made as if there's causes and effects in the world. Somebody has emotional things they're dealing with because they had an abortion and it's as if the abortion was an event in their lives. Or their parents got divorced when they were three years old and they feel like that they've had emotional traumas ever since then. Or they, they lost a, an arm in a fishing accident and they feel like that changed their life. Nonsense. There's nothing causative, there are no causes and effects in the world because the world is a world of images of unreal effects and what is the unreal cause of all these trillions and trillions and trillions of unreal effects? The ego. God did not create this world. God didn't create this world. We can't start pinning it on God. If God, God went wrong, went haywire, something went haywire. 
if if God created this world, 